それでは時間となりましたのでパラレルセッション10変革のためのポスト2015年開発アジェンダのコース Ladies and session, gentlemen, we would like、uh, to h o u again、uh, the session、uh, Building a Transformational Post 2015 Development Agenda Perspectives from HUD Asia.、Uh, we have、uh, as a moderator、uh, from HUD UNEP、uh, Dr. Shrendra Hashresta, Senior Advisor and Focal Point for Sustainable Development Goals. Please. Thank you very much.、Um, I'd like to welcome you to this session on building. Transformational post 2015 development agenda、uh, with perspectives from uh, Asia. Uh, we have, uh, I want to just outline the session、um, and then we can begin. But before I do that, if I can just go through our distinguished panel of experts,、uh, we have Dr. David Griggs, who is the director of Monash Sustainability Institute. Uh, he will be presenting the conceptual framework、um, at the global level.、Uh, Professor Wada from Doshisa University、uh, will、uh, look at the metrics, especially the footprint、um, uh, for sustainable development.、Uh, next, we have Mr. Yoshida, who is the task manager at IGS. Uh, he will take、uh, one sector, one specific sector, energy, and look at global to national potential、uh, goals and clustering. And、uh, last,、uh, we have George,、uh, who is the president of Development Alternatives,、uh, looking at national to local level implementation.、Um, so we have conceptual framework, the metrics. Uh, specific sector and、uh, national local level implementation.、Uh, before we、um, start, I would like to present you with a background and the context for this discussion.、Uh, next, we will have the, our、uh, expert panel make a presentation、uh, and then answer four specific questions, and then we have about half an hour. For a question and answer session before concluding.、Um, so, first, let me、uh, present you with, with a short background on、um, the 2015 development agenda and where we are with the discussions in、uh, New York. If I can have the slides. Uh, next one, please.、Oh, do I need to go there? Yeah,、um, as, as you are well aware, we've had many summits, many declarations、uh, over the past couple of decades. These are just the main ones that I、uh, put forward from 1972 in Stockholm when the Environment,、uh, ecology was first discussed、um, to the latest one、uh, in June 2012 at Rio,、uh, or also called Rio Plus 20 conference.、Um, a lot of、uh, rhetoric, as people have said, or the media has criticized.、Uh, and at Rio Plus 20, the mandate. Was to reaffirm and confirm. It, it did not have a new mandate to do additional.、Um, so many conferences, many declarations, and、uh, with hindsight,、uh, everybody agrees implementation is lacking.、Uh, we know what is wrong、uh, with our society and、uh, with the planet. Um, but now we need to move to how.、Um, some key documents that are being looked at、um, at the global level by the 193 member states in the General Assembly、um, when looking at the post 2015 development agenda.、Uh, first,、um, the Secretary General's action agenda.、Um, in January of 2015, Uh, 12, uh, when he got the mandate for another term,、uh, he came up after a discussion with member states as well as with UN agencies 
uh, document on the action agenda for his second term, uh, which serves as a guideline or direction uh, for all the UN agencies under his leadership. So in that document, um, he already identified sustainable development as the overarching goal for all UN agencies. Um, and this was back in January. Uh, then next we have the Global Sustainability Panel. Again, as you are aware, presidents of South Africa and Finland uh, co-chaired um, this panel. Um, they presented their report um, February, March last year. And in this document too, um, sustainable development is identified as overarching goals. And they also came up with the term uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Then in uh, June 2012, uh, we had the Rio Plus 20 conference at Rio. Um, we, some of the major outcomes, uh, CSD is replaced by the high-level political forum. Uh, it is now a resolution decision of the General Assembly and it has come into effect. Uh, UNEP uh, has been upgraded with universal membership. Um, and also another outcome was SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. Um, um, in end of May, the high-level panel, again co-chaired by presidents of Indonesia, Liberia, and the Prime Minister of UK, uh, after, again, consultations globally have come up uh, with this uh, report. Um, they have put down five transformative shifts, as uh, they call it, and uh, sustainable development, again, at the core. Um, so in all the documents, I think there is wide consensus that sustainable development is the path we need to go on. And how to achieve that is now <clears throat> being discussed uh, um, at the political level as well as at the scientific and expert level. So MDGs, or the Millennium Development Goals, as you are aware, um, was uh, from 20 to year 2000 to 2015. It will expire in 2015, and that's where that term post-2015 development agenda comes from. Um, eight goals, easy to remember, simple, but this is targeting the bottom billion, as it were, um, by the developed countries, assisting um, the least developed countries, and um, you know the evaluation which uh, the, our panel of experts will discuss later um, the experience, the lessons of MDGs. Um, this is the process that is currently underway in New York. Um, on the upper, uh, upper line, uh, you see the years 2012 to 2016. Um, the blue flags represent the General Assembly meetings, uh, usually held September of each year. Um, on the upper portion uh, is the Secretary General-led UN process. Um, so we have the UN task team. They have come up uh, with their report and recommendation. Uh, we have the high-level panel report I just mentioned. And we have the UNDG, uh, or the UN Development Group, that have made wide consultations uh, in over 170 countries on um, both the MDG experience and evaluation, as well as looking ahead uh, what the public think should be uh, coming as the post-2015 uh, development agenda. Uh, and the second half of the slide um, is the member state-led process or the General Assembly-led process where the countries themselves are uh, leading the discussion. So this is the open working group uh, on SDGs. Um, there are 70 member states uh, occupying 30 seats. Uh, for example, Japan, Nepal, and Iran occupies one seat um, in the discussions. So there are 70 total, 30 seats, and they are 
uh, discussing or formulating the sustainable development goals uh, from this year until March next year. They are saying they are in an information gathering mode. They are listening to experts, to scientists, to think tanks. And then from March to September, they will be articulating the goals that they will all agree on. Um, so supporting uh, the open working group is the technical support team of all the UN agencies. And there's also a scientific group uh, that is supporting uh, this working group. Um, so by September 2014, they hope to come up with an interim uh, set, have wide consultations across the globe in 2015, and by September 2015, um, to come to a conclusion on what the post-2015 development agenda is. Uh, there is also another working group uh, on finance. Again, there are 30 member states mainly experts from finance ministries and central, uh, central banks. Um, they're sitting together and discussing the means of implementation. Um, one is the substance, which the Open Working Group is looking at, and the means of the how part is being uh, discussed at the finance uh, working group. So this is the process. And just to quickly run through uh, the key substance that's being discussed, the, there is agreement that the overarching goal should be sustainable development and poverty eradication. Um, there is also a general consensus that uh, we need to embrace the concept of well-being, um, prioritizing human well-being within the limitations of the planet well-being. And you'll hear more of this from our panel of experts. And the core principles that are being discussed that support the sustainable development goals are human rights, inclusive social development, equitable economic development, environment sustainability. So pillars um, that for the SDGs. Um, the global goals will be aspirational, and each country can then set targets to those goals according to their pace of development, according to their national budgets and external support. And there is also agreement that poverty and consumption are two sides of the same coin when we live in a finite uh, world with finite natural resources and finite environment services. Uh, there's also general agreement that the metrics need to change, that uh, we GDP is not sufficient beyond GDP or GDP plus should be the measure of performance at the national level. And each of the goals, targets should have universal indicators so that we can measure the progress and aggregate it from local, national, regional to global level. And um, that it should be time bound, that if we have a 30 or 15 year goal and target, we should be able to uh, slice that into national political calendar. Our political leadership is not interested beyond um, their term or beyond the political calendar and next elections. So we need to be able to have sub-goals within the overall 15, uh, 20, 30 year goals. So um, this is the brief background to set it uh, in the context. Um, I would like to now invite Dr. David uh, Griggs to uh, make the first uh, presentation. And this will be followed um, by Professor Wada, Mr. Yoshida, and George. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've heard it said that uh, climate change is the greatest challenge uh, facing humanity. Uh, I've also heard it said that uh, poverty eradication and, and human development is the greatest challenge facing humanity. At this conference, I've even heard um, the challenge of maintaining biodiversity is the greatest challenge facing humanity. 
Um, what I'm going to argue is that doing all of those things at the same time is the greatest challenge facing humanity. Um, and so the, the way that we have pursued uh, development to date has been through um, a pathway where we have used our world's natural resources to um, fuel that development. So we've exchanged natural capital for human and social capital. And the first thing I'm going to suggest is that we can no longer do that. And I'm going to start off with a short film to explain why I think the rules of, of the game have changed. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much, yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. So, I think that states it fairly clearly. As a human population, we're now influencing uh, the, the Earth's natural systems on a scale equivalent to those of natural processes. If you look at these graphs, you probably can't read the titles, you don't need to. But it, it illustrates, the thing you, you look at is that all of those curves have the same shape. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about population or GDP or foreign direct investment or damming of rivers or water use or fertilizer consumption or urban population or paper consumption or motor vehicles or even the growth of McDonald's restaurants. It all has the same shape. We, we've all undergone this exponential growth since about the 1950s. And what's happening is that the Earth's natural systems are responding, not surprisingly, in exactly the same way. So if we talk about greenhouse gas concentrations of carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, whether we talk about ozone depletion, surface temperatures, great floods, damage to ocean ecosystems and, or coastal zones, damage to our biogeochemistry, the loss of tropical woodland, all of those are responding in exactly the same way to the drivers that we are forcing on them. So that's why... Um, yeah, we can't continue in this sort, of, uh, this sort of exponential way. This is another way of measuring global impact, um, looking at population times affluence times technology, and the little boxes down at the bottom of the pyramid there show 1900 and 1950, and then the big box shows 
2011. You can see that, you know, that, that our impact has, has grown extremely rapidly. That's had certain impacts. This one is on biodiversity. The rate of biodiversity loss is already to 100 to 1,000 times greater than its normal background extinction rate. And that's projected to increase by a further factor of 10 over the next 50 years. Uh, this shows surface temperatures. The, the, the black line shows European temperatures in, 2000, uh, um, in, in temperatures in Europe. And you can see the little one that starred there, uh, which was 2003. Um, which stuck out as the European summer heat wave. Uh, 40,000 people died in Europe that year. Um, the thing to notice is that as that curve, which is the red curve, which is the projections of global temperatures into the future, you see that by the 2040s, that becomes a normal summer in Europe. And by the 2060s, it becomes an unusually cold summer. So that gives you a kind of you know, grasp of the magnitude. So this, if you look at the, the target, the blue curve there, is the sort of two degree guardrail which we're trying to achieve. If we don't limit greenhouse gas emissions, we're, we're heading more on the, the project, trajectory of the right, the, the, the blue, the red curve. And if you look, that's me and my lifetime. And this is a very difficult graph to draw because you have to assume when you're going to die. Um, <laughs> so I, I've been very scientific about it and assumed the, the average lifespan of a, of a human being. Um, so this is my children who were born in the mid 1980s. Um, and I don't have any grandchildren yet, but they are, hope, I'm hopeful. Um, but my children will be horrified if they saw this slide. Um, and just look at the, the climate change that they could expect to see in their lifetime if we don't do something about climate change. So sustainable development is not something that's desirable, it's essential. So what are we trying to achieve? Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's the the most common definition of sustainable development from the Brundtland Commission. It's generally uh, described in this way. Uh, three pillars of sustainable development are the economy, social, and environment. Social, economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. I would argue that this kind of thing has been happening, where the, the economy has been impacting on social sustainability, which has been, then been impacting on environmental sustainability to the point where this is what we're trying to avoid happening. So what a group of authors and I did in a recent paper in Nature, including Professor Kanye here from Japan, is we tried to reframe and come up with a new paradigm for, for sustainable development, where the economy is actually embedded in and serves society. And that society is constrained and lives within the Earth's natural support, Earth's life support systems. So if you look at it now from 1900 on the left, the economy was very small because society was very small and the world was essentially infinite. So we could develop in the way that we've developed. It was perfectly logical to exploit our natural resources to develop in this way. Not much had changed by the 1950s, but now on the right hand side, our economy has grown, our society has grown to the point where we are impacting on the Earth's life support systems. And that, that, what, that outer circle can't get any bigger. Um, so, at the moment, you know, we're, we're here on the right-hand side, but our mindset is still back where we were. We're still trying to develop in the way that we have always developed through exploitation of our natural resources and the natural environment. So what we came up with was this um, new uh, framing, if you like, of the way that to, to do this and come up with a set of six sustainable development goals, all of which integrated the economy, society, and environment. So thriving lives and livelihoods, people have to be able to live and provide that well-being that uh, the chairman talked about in his introduction. So things like that are health, education, empowerment of women, and so on. Sustainable food security. People um, have to provide enough food, but that has to be provided in a sustainable way. So it's no use um, turning over more and more land to feed the nine billion people that there are going to be on the planet if at the same time we're destroying the world's biodiversity by turning that land over to cultivation. Secure, sustainable water. Again, an essential for, for human life. Universal clean energy. Again, we have to do that in a way, the world is going to need more energy to serve the, the needs of the people that, uh, on the planet, but we're going to need to do that in a way that's more sustainable. Healthy and productive ecosystems, so we have to ma maintain not only the biodiversity, but also we have to maintain the services that those ecosystems are able to provide. 
And finally, governance for sustainable societies. This is about state building, it's about governance, it's about appropriate institutions, um, so that um, you know, institutions are not working at cross purposes to each other. So there's a lot more detail that sits behind this framing, but that's really all I have time to go into at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Allow me to speak in Japanese. I'm from Hadoshisha University. My name is Wada. I am pleased to be able to speak on the indicator of ecological footprint. How useful ecological footprint would be in order to achieve sustainable development? is what I would like to dwell upon. The sustainable development, as a term, uh, Professor Hattagrig has given us highly professional uh, definition. But there are more simplified definition as well. Sustainability means living well within the means of nature, as it says on the slide. That is to say, sustainability means uh, to live within uh, the limit of the nature and uh, to live well and be happy. So that could be another more simplified definition of what is to be a sustainable development. And the ecological footprint as an indicator is right here within the means of nature, that our economic activities that must be contained within the means of nature. If it goes beyond the means of nature, how much has it gone outside of the bound? And to what extent will we be able to reduce so that it would be contained within the means of nature? We had that beautiful picture earlier on the economy or the economic activity is that just a part of society and part of the environment, something to support the economy. So you have all sorts of different land which will provide resources and then waste such as CO2 generated would be absorbed and cleaned up through uh, such resources. But uh, uh, we have to say that, that uh, our lives uh, are based upon uh, the wonderful ecosystem services provided by the planet. But we need to think about the limits, the means of the nature, to go beyond the means of nature, to paraphrase it, means to overshoot Economist Captain that has given the definition, we need to avert the overshooting. The simple definition of overshooting is the biocapacity or the carrying capacity of the planet if it goes beyond uh, the limit. There is a consumption of ecosystem services exceeding that level, but that needs to be avoided, strictly avoided, because overshooting means the so-called uh, the principle, the national capital is being drawn down. So on temporary basis, overshooting may be possible, but it cannot be sustained because the principle, the natural capital itself will be depleted. So the biocapacity or the carrying capacity of the planet, if it goes beyond the limit, the natural capital will dwindle and then deplete and collapse. So at the earliest time possible, we need to recognize the overshooting and try to rectify the overshooting uh, to once again the be contained within the limits 
of the barrier capacity. And we have been tried uh, to quantify what I have been explaining. And 20 years or so ago, the ecological footprint of, as a concept was uh, developed. The ecosystems and uh, the footprint. Footprint means to what extent the human beings uh, have been impacting on the biosystem, uh, be footing and tramping on the ecosystem, to how much are we dependent upon the ecosystem, uh, which is being expressed in terms of uh, the, uh, the area uh, size. And the concept was developed by Professor William E. Rees, as well as uh, Professor Mark Mathis Wackernagel, his uh, student. I was uh, at the same university going through the master course, and uh, I had the pleasure of being able to be taught by these two distinguished uh, professors. And from uh, the, the latter half of 1990s, this concept has uh, been taken up uh, globally. And an ecological footprint, the contribution of the concept was accepted, the contribution to the sustainable development. In 2012, uh, the Nobel Prize for the Environment, the Blue Planet uh, Pri uh, Award, uh, that was uh, given to the two uh, professors. Now, ecological footprint means the economic system, in order to be maintained and sustained, we need enormous amount of resources. And such resources are produced by different ecosystems, croplands, the arable lands, or the forests, or the grazing lands. And also, the CO2 needs to be absorbed by the forests, so the sinks. There's also carbon footprint, and also something important for us Japanese, the fishing grounds and the built-up area, those land which could have been used for ecosystem service production are being occupied by buildings, roads and highways, as well as other uh, the infrastructure. The total area is being added up and being called the ecological footprint. Then against the ecological footprint, how much of uh, the supply side nature still exists on our planet? We need to make the comparison. For the supply side, which is biocapacity, the carrying capacity, The total land area where the ecosystem service can be produced, 22%, 4% on the sea, and 18% on land. These are the land where ecosystem services are being produced and provided of the total surface area of our planet. The green line shows the biocapacity, the magnitude of biocapacity. And as year progresses, of course, there are variations because of the climate change. And the BC stands for biocapacity. About 12 billion global hectares. On the ecological footprint, on the other hand, for the whole humankind is right here, about 18 billion global hectares, about 50% in excess. On per capita basis, it is 1.8 global hectare of biocapacity, whereas 2.6 global hectare on per capita basis are being used up, that is to say, ecological footprint. So 
from 1970 onwards, for the whole mankind, the ecological footprint has overshot the biocapacity. And if the situation persists, the biocapacity or the ecosystem itself may collapse. So the biggest would be the absorptions of uh, the CO2, uh, the forestry, but then croplands, the arable lands are also expanding. Right now, the unit we use for the land area is the global hectare, GHA. I cannot go into details of how we calculate the global hectare, but uh, we have uh, a differential uh, in terms of uh, the absorption capacity that for the waste and also productive ca capacity for the resources for the land area and the water area we have a definition as one hectare uh, if it is simple addition i don't think we will be able to have a more equitable comparison so we have used a standardized unit the one hectare of water as well as land area uh, of uh, uh, the global, the mean, the value in terms of uh, a capability to absorb the waste as well as a pro to produce resources. This is on per capita the basis, the ecological footprint looking by country. The vertical axis is per capita ecological footprint, and the horizontal axis is the Human Development Index, the HDI. If it is at or more than 0 0.8 of HDI, it means that uh, you will be able to enjoy very human and dignified a livelihood, very decent at the life. And as I have mentioned already, already for sustainability within the 1.8 global hectares uh, to be able to enjoy very happy life, and for HDI at or more than 0.8, right here, within this box, the square, if and when a country is included in this box, the sustainable economic uh, growth can be achieved. So when and if every country can uh, be contained within this box, the Earth as a whole will be able to see a sustainable growth. This is from a global the network, from WWF, I have jointly produced this, and this is included in uh, the Japan Ecological Footprint tw 2012. You will be able to download from the website, so I hope you will take a look at this. Uh, this is available in English as well. Looking at each country, how the ecological footprint uh, has been uh, utilized and the cases are given. For example, Ecological footprint as an indicator is being used in Europe as well as Latin America. Uh, it is very popular, but more recently it is gaining popularity. For example, in Southeast Asia, the Philippines, President Aquino uh, is uh, the very keen and eager to utilize ecological footprint as an indicator. And in autumn last year, uh, a report uh, was produced. And ecological footprint going forward will have to be utilized uh, for a policy evaluation. And also, Ecuador is another country which uh, make use of ecological footprint. Then how about Japan? 
inside Japan, the first time that the term was used in the white paper was back in 1996. And in 2006, I have to apologize, this is a very uh, the busy slide. This has been used as an indicator uh, as for the sustainability uh, to evaluate uh, the basic environmental plan. And WWF Japan also has put forward uh, the Ecological Footprint Report and also Living Planet Report. And amongst uh, the private sector companies, some businesses are very eager uh, to the take up. For instance, Kao is one example from procurement of materials up until the waste disposal, looking at the whole spectrum of the life cycle. They are making assessment using the ecological footprint. It often happens that carbon footprint is the focus of attention, but Kao has also made evaluation, including uh, the crop lands as well as the grazing lands and the forestry. Ecological footprint would be more relevant looking at the total picture. So that is the reason why Kao as a company has chosen ecological footprint rather than carbon footprint. In the interest of time, let me also make some comments to indicate what may be the future of for our research. So the national footprint uh, account uh, has uh, been uh, taken, looking at each country. And it was mostly analysis into land. Uh, but uh, increasingly, they are using uh, the regional input-output uh, table analysis. So or more detailed uh, analysis are made from uh, social economic point of view. For instance, when a rice has been consumed, what may be the ecological footprint, that kind of detailed analysis is now possible. And going forward, the CGE, the computed, uh, computable general equilibri equilibrium analysis can be made using the CGE software. So scenario analysis would be made possible. Lastly, how can we improve the ecological footprint, if I may make some comments on this? As an indicator, ecological footprint is something quite useful in that us Japanese are quite dependent upon foreign resources. Thus, there is a lot of ecological footprint as made by Japan on foreign uh, the grounds, foreign resources. Uh, that is the kind of information that could be provided. So the extended uh, responsibility, spatial as well as time-wise, uh, can also be analyzed. For instance, rare earth and other metal resources are being utilized. Then how to manage the waste, that would be on the bird on the shoulders of the next generation. And the next generation must uh, shoulder the, this environmental burden. The responsibility is on their shoulders. So we need to have uh, this timeline also included uh, in the analysis and evaluation. Then and only then we will be able to have a more equitable and fair assessment. So today, I have uh, tried to explain to you ecological footprint may be something very useful as a yardstick. And it is increasing in popularity to try to assess what kind of impact the economic activities by one country uh, is the being seen on the planet. And I hope that that, that ecolo ecological footprint as indicator would be increasingly uh, taken up in Asia. Thank you very much. At the entrance, I have provided per capita ecological footprint chart by country. 
I hope uh, you will be able uh, to uh, pick uh, this up when you leave this hall. The Global Footprint Network, uh, Mr. Ida has provided this. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tetsuro Yoshida. I'm a senior researcher and the task manager on SDG's research of IGES. Um, today, I'd like to take up uh, the case of energy goals. Um, yes. Um, when we think of uh, sustainable development goals, we have to bear in mind that uh, uh, these goals would be, uh, will be voluntary goals, which are not legally binding. Um, so they are not um, like a climate change targets, which could be uh, legally binding for some countries. Um, <clears throat> um, so um, we have to think about how could these like voluntary goals uh, really exert positive influence and uh, transform the business as usual. Um, first of all, um, as Sarendra uh, mentioned, um, there are uh, some characteristics, like success, uh, success factors um, of uh, such goals, and uh, they are already uh, mentioned in the outcome document of post uh, um, Rio Plus 20 uh, conference, um, but we, first of all, um, these goals, uh, for these goals to exert uh, positive influence, these, uh, they should be simple and uh, easily understandable and also universal. Um, for MDGs, some countries used, um, used them as, even for planning purposes at national level, but um, because uh, the, the number of goals is quite limited, and uh, there, there, there were only eight MDGs. And for SDGs, um, there would be probably around 10 goals. Um, so it is not possible to uh, accommodate all the diversity of um, issues around the world. So you, we, we believe that the, they are not really an effective tool for planning purposes, but rather uh, we believe that um, they should be um, used as uh, like awareness raising and also, um, yes, uh, advo uh, advocacy tool. Um, and as such, um, we believe that they need to be uh, reason reasonably stretching, not over overly ambitious, and uh, because for MDGs there have been some criticisms that uh, the goals were too ambitious, especially for sub-Saharan sub uh, sub -Saharan countries, because their starting points were quite low, and it was very challenging and unrealis unrealistic for some countries to half the poverty level, for example. And uh, some developing countries need a good reference when they develop uh, their own targets. Um, and also, uh, this goes without saying, but uh, they, they need to present the most pressing global issues um, in a balanced manner. And uh, as Professor Griggs pointed out, uh, there, should, there should be a balance between uh, human well-being and the sustainability of the Earth system, and uh, should be informed by science and evidence. Um, this seems quite uh, normal, but uh, in reality, um, when the international negotiations go on, uh, they sometimes are not and negotiations are not really well informed by science, science and evidence. And uh, going back to this, the principle of sustainability, 
Um, the, they should be based on intergenerational equity um, and uh, long-term perspectives. And also the reason uh, we take up this case of energy is that uh, energy is particularly important to demonstrate this issue of interlinkages. Um, I wrote energy, health, climate change, and water, but this goes beyond these sectors. For example, education, um, with, the, with the, for example, solar lantern, uh, like children can study uh, longer hours, and also women can do some domestic work, uh, even at night. And uh, also, um, the goals uh, better be, had better be positive and action-oriented and aspirational. And uh, we argue that uh, rather than like a goal to reduce um, like a greenhouse gas emissions, probably we'd better have like a goals on the share increasing the share of renewable energy or on forestry, um, which eventually would have, could have um, like same effects as climate change uh, targets. And also they need to be measurable with a solid set of indicators. Um, this is also um, emphasized in several reports that uh, um, data revolution needs to happen. Um, for like effective monitoring. Um, why global energy goals? I probably said much already, but um, energy is a global issue with linkages with other very important developmental issues. And so if we, if we succeed in um, setting the right effective goals and also the implementation that could uh, improve human well-being, local environment, and even climate change mitigation. So we believe energy goal is, will be essential. And of course, not, I was not covered by MDGs. And if we look at the current situation, over 3 billion people still rely on traditional biomass, such as uh, coal and uh, animal waste um, for cooking and heating. This is not desirable for obvious reasons. And 1.5 billion people have still no access to electricity. And also the indispensability of uh, energy is well acknowledged. Um, for poverty eradication. So this is an urgent issue. And also it causes uh, climate change and the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions is um, due to energy. And uh, like uh, Professor Griggs showed um, in his slides that the population is bound to increase we are over 7 billion people even now, and uh, it's expected to grow further. And as the population grows, of course, global energy demand grows as well. And it's estimated 33% from 2010 to 2035. Um, and also, Okay, in the, in the sustainable energy for all goals that I will, I will show later, um, there's a dilemma, possible dilemma, between ensuring energy access and also um, increasing the share of renewable energy. Um, of course, for developing countries, um, ensuring energy access is the priority rather than increasing the share of renewable energy. Um, and uh, I, I put two questions in this respect. 
Should donors provide funding for the construction of coal-fired power plants, for example, to improve energy access, um, compromising our climate change um, agenda? And this is, I, I just put a, a little bit provocative question. Can donors insist on renewables for developing countries when EU has only 13% renewable share of final energy. Um, so, and uh, the left-hand figure shows that uh, the list of uh, high-impact countries for energy access and uh, non-solid fuel access deficit and uh, primary energy demand. And if you look, you, you'd realize that India is very uh, important key country for all the, all the areas. So I, I, I chose this uh, right-hand graph. Um, this, is, this shows the, the, the share of um, like a ODA, Official Development Aid to India in the uh, energy sector. And if you look, look um, actually renewable energy related assistance is quite substantial, but you'd realize that other fossil fuel based energy share is quite high as well. And, uh, and in the next slide, I put the figure on uh, energy expenditure of India and if you look, you'd realize that renewable energy related expenditure is really minimal uh, in relation to other uh, fossil fuel based energy. So uh, this shows that the energy access is still priority with significant expenditure on natural gas and petroleum for India and the budget allocated for renewable energy is minimal compared to fossil fuel and nuclear energy. So my, my argument is, okay, donors don't need to uh, worry about um, insisting too much on renewables. I think they should, they should uh, insist on renewables still. Um, this is the Sustainable Energy for All goals. Um, probably many of you already know, but this is about ensuring uh, universal access to modern energy services and doubling the rate of uh, improvement in energy efficiency and uh, doubling the share of renewable energy in the global energy mix. Um, this is not officially uh, adopted as such by member state, UN member states, but uh, at least 80 countries already uh, sh um, com showed uh, commitments to these goals. And a substantial fund has been raised as well for this, um, not only from the governments, but private companies, NGOs, and multilateral development banks. Um, and also, uh, there have been some uh, proposals already on uh, energy goals by the UN high-level panel, for example, and um, SDSN, Sustainable Solutions Develop Development Network by Professor Jeffrey Sachs. They all um, use this, this, this set of three goals and for their proposals. And uh, for, this, for monitoring and evaluation, the grant work has been done already by the World Bank and international energy agencies. And uh, they, they published a report and they suggested indicators and also uh, potential issues. Here, I would like to argue, okay, these SE for all objectives are well designed, but they are they ambitious enough? 
Um, as I said, um, there, there will be a, like sub substantial growth in energy demand in coming decades. And so progress in energy efficiency and in renewable energy could be offset by this growth. And IASA, it's a research institute in Austria, they calculated that uh, even if all these three goals are to be met by 2030, not really certain whether we could achieve two uh, degree climate change goal. And they suggested the probability would be probably between 66 to 90 percent. So we argue that probably goal on reduction in per capita energy consumption could be necessary for advanced countries with the high uh, per capita energy consumption. And also we we say we argue that uh, scenario based study is still lacking uh, it's not enough to suggest uh, to set the level of ambition of these global goals and here i'd like to um, talk a little bit about how to link uh, global goals with the national targets and i took the renewable energy targets as an example, because this is, the, this is an obvious uh, example. Um, there are already uh, targets for renewable energy uh, in at least 138 countries, and most of which are developing countries. And uh, actually, these targets are set in, uh, in uh, not not in a consistent manner. Um, some countries um, put set targets in terms of uh, capacity installed. Um, some based on final energy consumption rather than like primary energy. And also the target years are quite different. So. Um, while we argue that okay, renewable energy targets need to be set at the national level because each country has varying potentials. Um, Iceland, for example, has like 100% 100, 100 uh, renewable energy for the electricity, at least. So um, then there needs to be a national, um, national level targets for renewables. Um, and also we argue that to ensure like comparability and uh, facilitate the monitoring at the global level, um, these um, national targets need to be consistent and standardized and should be aligned with the global goals. And uh, we suggest, we recommend that, okay, probably it will be better in terms of final energy consumption and the uh, target year be 2030 as the, the same, same target year as the SE for all. Um, this is a brief analysis of um, implementation um, using the global goals. Um, and our conclusion is good implementation ultimately depends on national, national governance. This might um, be quite obvious, but I just uh, made a table of successful factors for renewable energy deployment at the national level. First and foremost, the uh, solid policy and legal framework is important. Um, some countries adopted renewable energy related law, um, uh, introducing a feed in tariff, for example, and the roadmap, st a strategy paper. And they, some countries established uh, energy regu uh, regulatory commissions. And um, obviously, there, we need a strong will, political will, 
and uh, multi-stakeholder acceptance. And this is um, shown uh, quite important, shown by the, the case in Germany, for example. And uh, obviously finance and the capacity in terms of uh, hu human capacity and, um, and grid capacity, for example. And also this um, like a, a systems to increase, like feed-in tariff, for example. Um, there should be like a transparent process to, to set the tariff, for example. Um, so all in all, the role of national government is still like predominantly important. Yoshida, maybe you'd like to yeah. wrap up. Okay, sorry. Um, well, here are conclusions. Just to, just to wrap up, uh, energy was not covered by MDGs, and uh, it could have uh, multiple benefits. So this is uh, uh, certainly the most important, uh, one of the most important uh, area sectors. And SE for all is a good example of the coalition of the willing, which mobilized like a multi-stakeholders, and uh, so we expect like smaller bottom-up coalitions to follow suit. And uh, in addition to these three goals, probably we need a goal on reduction in per capita energy consumption, if we think about the seriousness of cl um, climate change um, going on, and also people. At the end of the day, people act according to their self-interest. So how we, can we create a set of goals uh, which um, motivate the self-interest of uh, major stakeholders? And as I said, the, the role of government is still predominantly important. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Fortunately, I'm not as tall as Tetsuro, so I can use the mic straight here. Uh, coming after three speakers who have laid out the conceptual frame in terms of what could be the post-2015 development agenda, I'm primarily going to focus in terms of how do you incorporate local priorities into the kind of global goals that are coming up in the post-2015 development agenda. In this context, and as you heard from the first plenary yesterday onwards, the sustainability imperative, and Professor Giggs did it just now, is more urgent than ever before. And what you notice, the slides with Surinder put up, since 1972, if you just look at some of the key ones, every 10 years, we've had some kind of a global summit or the other. But, What are the outcomes of these summits? At the end of the day, you have some kind of principles, you have some kind of declarations, you have some kind of action plans, you have some kind of reports. What does this mean to local communities is a question, I don't know how many times it's really been asked, but if you really work with the local communities, they say, listen, there is some hot air flowing out there whether in New York, in Geneva, in New Delhi, or Tokyo. <laughs> and to us, does this thing make any real difference? Frankly, the truth is, nobody knows. Given that, what I've tried to put together is a set, set of slides in terms of how can we relate these two worlds, global goals, and local priorities, how can we relate them? And to do this, what I've done with a simplistic mind as a practitioner, and not fortunately working in 
in an academic environment, try to look at five simple key dimensions of sustainability in terms of what I call the five E's. I'm coming to each one of these. Ultimately, in order to attain empowerment for the local communities, and like one of my close neighboring countries from where I come from, Bhutan, the nation itself is looking at something called Grosh National Happiness Index. Now, is that possible for local communities? Now, what I'm going to emphasize on is practical examples in each of these cases. So I'm not going to rattle through the ease just now, and, and you'll see what I mean in each of these cases, especially in the context of local communities. The first one, in fact, I know the wine glass where the top 20% per, uh, of the human species consumes 80%. A wine glass, and in fact, the representation of this in terms of instability, the wine glass can fall down at any minute. So I think the image we need to keep is sustainability means resilience over the long term. Can you convert the wine glass into a beer glass? That's what we are looking at. And we all like beer not only wine. And given that, one simple question that one needs to ask ourselves, this is a child in rural India, this is also a child in rural India. Can our development goals, indicators, targets, reflect equity, equality in terms of opportunity, equal access to both. We call it inclusive growth, call it what you may, but is there equal access possible with all the kind of investments that we are putting in? So the first E of equity is, is equal access possible? If we make that, I think we have made a major dent. Let's look at the next one. Economic efficiency, and I know it was men mentioned by Tetsuro in the context of renewable energy. And I'll come back to renewable energy, I think I have it in this. This is a handmade paper unit, which I run. Some of my colleagues from IGES and some other colleagues sitting here have seen this handmade paper unit run by 40 women. These women shown in these pictures are actually entrepreneurs running this whole enterprise. We develop the technology for them. Now, what's the interesting part of this? They get dignified jobs, they're entrepreneurs in self, they're using local waste as resources. So it's one of the most environmentally sound enterprises which local communities can run from themselves using local resources. Now, if that be the case, and <coughs> there are indicators, targets, and global goals, how does this get reflected into that? That's what the people need to know. Let me go on to the third example, endogeneity. Endogeneity is, I come from the land of Mahatma Gandhi, and yesterday I remember Dr. Pachori mentioned Mahatma Gandhi in the beginning. The question of self-reliance, self-reliance does not mean selfishness. In fact, in today's modern context, it means how much can you do on your own and then get into trade. For example, this is again a BIMO station which we have set up. This is run by a women's group of approximately 20, uh, 20 or 22 odd women. In fact, first it was because of the religious connotation in India, you're not supposed to kill cows. So they had an old age home for cows. With the old age home, they start, started collecting the cow dung which was used at feedstock for biomass, uh, biomethanation. So you run a microgrid, use it for local enterprises, in the context which Tetsuro was mentioning. Now, the context of contributing to local self-reliance and contributing to the local economy how does this get re reflected in the indicators, targets, and global goals? That's another question. The next example, 
environmental soundness. Basically, two principles that we are reflecting to. One, which has been mentioned, and most of you are very aware of it, especially in Japan, the polluter has to pay. So how does it get reflected? The more, from the context of developing countries, the more important one being resource efficiencies. This is a building, in, incidentally, this is the headquarters building of my own organization. The old building was completely pulverized and put into new mud blocks that are in this building. So you have resources. It was completely built out of waste. Now, if so locally relevant green building technologies, which this is the mud blocks, five people using this technology package that we have developed can earn a livelihood rather than going for ODA. It's possible for them with their own resources to stand on their own feet. Yes, a little bit of capital investment is required in the beginning and opportunity for credit facilities required. Now, if this has to be modernized, and I'm speaking in Japan, Japan has some of the best modern technologies. Now, how can it be made relevant to these local communities, either to produce these mud blocks or to these tiles? This, again, five women run an enterprise making these tiles. Now, if these become resource-efficient enterprises, how do they get reflected in indicators, targets, and goals? And finally, because I don't have an expert example from the developing world. I'm going to give you an example that is from New York. Ecological harmony that has been spoken about, and I know the ecological footprint was mentioned again by my predecessor. Um, this is in 1997, and it's quite old. When the city governors in New York were looking at an opportunity for improving their water supply system, they tendered out the process, and option one that came was 6.5 billion initial investment plus 3 million US dollars in 1997 recurring costs per annum. This is the engineering solution. It was slightly expensive, so these guys had to rethink. When they were rethinking, somebody came along the way and said, listen, there's another way of doing it. Upstream, in Catskills, if you do conservation at the cost of about $700 million, one-time investment. In fact, there was a mention yesterday of investing in environmental and ecological work rather than exploiting. This investment is actually providing the water in New York City even today. So, now, how do these kinds of ideas get reflected into this new transformational post-2015 agenda is going to be the question that we will have to answer. Finally, if we take the five E's, incidentally, this is, in my own country, approximately half the women are illiterate. We are running a literacy program for women uh, in 60 days, they can be made literate, both in terms of alphabets and numerics. That's the first point from which then we convert some of them into entrepreneurs, life skills, and enterprise. How do these kind of things get reflected in our development goals? Which is the first point of empowerment, and finally, happiness for all. With this, I, I would like to summarize what are people, local communities, looking for? Number one, they're looking for maps. They cannot, there was a complex diagram just now that was shown. They cannot understand that. They need simple frames, which when implemented locally is relevant to them. Number two, they're looking for the simple methods to execute them. Number three, after executing, they're looking for the simple matrices to measure. And finally, a mission approach to implement at all three levels, because as was mentioned earlier, unfortunately, governance systems 
at all levels, going up to the global level, and we are not all aware of what is going on in the global level. Governance systems are unfortunately weak in the world today. So, strengthening these and responding to local priorities is going to be a challenge. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now go to the second part of the session. Uh, the organizers have kindly put together some questions for the panel of experts uh, to respond to uh, while we ask our experts to give short answers uh, to these questions. Uh, you may wish to formulate your questions um, to the experts. So I will quickly go through the four sets of questions the organizers have put together and then come back to you, the audience, to ask the questions. Uh, the first set of questions are on lessons from MDGs, and I ask, uh, request uh, Professor David Griggs to respond to this. Uh, what are the key lessons from MDG experience? How can MDGs or balance of MDGs left and SDGs be merged? How can universal goals be effective for developed, emerging, and developing countries? David, please. Thank you. Um, lessons from the MDGs. I think the first main lesson is that goals work. Um, they've been extremely flawed. Not all of the Millennium Development Goals have been achieved, but some of them have and there's been progress, and that's really the first time we've seen substantial progress in that kind of focused way. The goals did target international development. They did find their way into national economic and development plans. Um, so the first lesson to learn is that these kinds of goals, even though they're not legally binding, do work. Why do they work, and what are the key criteria to make them work? Well, first of all, they're, they're a small number. It's no point in having 50 goals, because people will just lose track. Um, they have to be simple in concept, written in plain English. Um, you know, it's no use putting um, very complex phrases in there that people don't understand. And they have to have measurable time-bound targets. And measurable time-bound targets that don't require half the world's financial resources to introduce measuring systems to be able to measure. Um, because that will just discourage countries from being able to measure them. How can MDGs and SDGs be merged? Um, I, I don't think there's a, we can't afford to not merge them. Um, two reasons to start with. First, if we don't merge them, we will miss synergies uh, between the environmental goals and the development goals. Um, you know, we will miss the synergies from you know, the, health, the health benefits of moving to more active forms of transport, the health benefits of of national parks and so on. We will also miss trade-offs. So where we're trying to do something good for development on the one hand, it can be bad for the environment on the other. So in food, we have to double food production over the next 30 years to feed the additional people on the world. Then you know, you'll have a food program running off and saying, well, let's, trans you know, let let's have more land for agriculture. But then you've got another agency who's trying to, pres you know, trying to stop deforestation to preserve uh, biodiversity, and they're working at cross purposes. Unless we can integrate these goals uh, in, one, in one way forward, then we will miss these synergies and these trade-offs. Um, and if we don't do this, then the development advances that we make will be undermined by environmental uh, factors. We will run out of natural resources, we will damage the natural environment, which will limit its ability to deliver the ecosystem services that we need. How can we come up with different goals for developed and developing countries? That's a real challenge. It's, it's, um, it's called what's called common but differentiated responsibilities. So essentially the MDGs were really focused on development because the environment one was largely ignored. Um, and they really only apply to developed, developing countries. Sustainable development goals have to be different. They have to apply to all countries. So I, I live in a country, Australia, which would say we've met the develop, Millennium Development Goals. In fact, they haven't. A lot of the indigenous communities in Australia are, are a long way behind meeting those goals. But they have not done that in a sustainable way. So how do we come up with goals and targets which are 
relevant to all countries that can be implemented at a national level from both developed and developing is a real challenge that we're working through at the moment. Um, we can't go the way of the climate convention, which says that we're going to in introduce an individual national target for every goal. We'll be mired in international negotiations for the next 50 years if we do that. So how do we, how do we come up with uh, relative goals uh, which set the target, set the goal, allow national implementation in different ways so that different nations can implement the targets in different ways, but we can still re reach the ultimate goal. Thank you very much. Um, second set of questions on interlinkages. Uh, request George and David to answer the two, one question each, uh, two questions. Uh, first one, how can issues such as food, energy, water, be clustered into the SDGs? Um, second, how can we strengthen vertical linkages, uh, global, national, subnational priorities, example, climate change, clean cities? Again, uh, let me deal with that food, water, energy linkage. And I'll give you this with a practical example, which we have actually done on the ground. We took a group of farmers, approximately 100 of them, in their farming. And in the context of arid India, we did an experiment over the last four or five years and found that this thing works. Now, what do you do? The kind of agricultural and farming practices that they are doing are virtually archaic. So you can and they do flood irrigation because they have not invested in irrigation. So the first thing that we did was worked around with them in terms of what are the kind of interesting farming practices that are possible. Based on these, we also introduced simple irrigation practices which they could afford in the form of drip and sprinkler irrigation. Immediately what happens is they need one third of the water they are currently using. And I'll tell you what it means in the context of a farmer. When they use one third of the water, there's two thirds that is saved, which means instead of one crop per year, when they had not enough water, they get two crops. Two crops means better food security. And also some surplus to sell. When the water requirement became only 60% because of the two crops. The energy requirement reduced. Because the energy requirement reduced, we were in a position to actually put biomass-based and solar-based energy systems. So the quantum of energy you use is less, the quantum of water you use is less, and in the process, you're also attaining food security. The question now is, how do you incorporate these into the goals? Frankly, we do not have the answer. Some of the research work that is going on, in fact, we're trying to work with IGES on this in terms of how to do the research work. We believe that most probably, if the ultimate can be seen as food security, the rest can be seen as indicators towards achieving the ultimate. But however, at this point of time, this is still work in progress, but I just gave you the practical example of what is going on. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add here. I think the first thing is to understand and recognize that there are these synergies and trade-offs. Um, and, and that's half the battle, so that people are not just working on what their part of the problem is. It's all about interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary implementation. And once those uh, trade-offs and synergies are understood, we then have to have appropriate, appropriate institutional and governance arrangements through which to exercise um, the actions. So it's no use having you know, a food program doing one thing and a water program doing something else and an energy program doing something else. They actually have to talk to each other. Um, the UK government has come up with a way that it's trying to do it, and it's by no means perfect. But for, all, for, everyone, for every issue like this, they've identified the lead government department, the, the lead department who um, will take primary responsibility. They've also then identified all the other government departments 
that have a relative stake in that issue. And it's the responsibility of that lead government department to consult with all of those other government departments in drawing up the policy. So that's a, that's a start. But as uh, we've said, you know, we, we are still very much in the research phase about learning how to do this. Thank you very much. Uh, third set of questions uh, on measurability metrics. Um, uh, two questions for Professor Wada and David. Uh, quick answers, please. Uh, first question, should all goals have targets with indicators? Um, second, how can we build capacity for data monitoring, evaluation, or in short, the data revolution that the panel report is talking about? So what up, please. If I may speak in Japanese, now measurability. Let me point out several things. First of all, Ecological Footprint Japan, NPO, which I serve as a, the chair member. Ecological Footprint, a per capita diagnostic test is posted on the website uh, with Hitachi Environmental Fund's support. There are 18 questions, and if you respond to those questions, you can see your own footprint, how many global hectares of the ecological footprint per capita. 1.8 global hectare uh, is the global average. How, how big is your um, ecological footprint is something that you will be able to learn. And this is fairly popular site. Several thousand, tens of thousands of accesses being made. And to the students of my university, I asked them to go through this testing. Uh, they are initially being hesitant to take the test. However, after going through the test, and if I read their feedbacks, they have studied about the environmental issues. However, they have never associated that with their li living, so living. So this has to do about the interlinkage. Uh, they did not know about the interlinkage. But after going through this test, how your own living depends on the ecosystem, how big your impact is, how small it is, um, how you will be able to manipulate um, your footprint in order to come closer uh, to the global average. The student seems to have learned a lot through going through this questionnaire. At the same time, personal efforts can be made to reduce one's footprint. However, it's very difficult to uh, come to uh, within the means of Earth. They have to go beyond the personal effort. Policy support. Take, for example, public transportation needs to be established by the central government and or possible a green tax introduction or change of the legal system. A structural change would be required. The students come to understand that. So this personal diagnostic test can lead to uh, people's demand for the government to change the system. Now, the second point about the measurability, talking about the ecological footprint, this is presented in the area. Take, for example, CO2 have the unit of grams or kilograms. So it is very different from other units. It is not the sheer difference in units used. But the presentations of area means that humans' economy or humans' living, to what extent it absolutely depends on the land as well as the ecosystem. People would recognize uh, one's association uh, with the land or the ecosystem. In other words, um, we depend so much on the earth and the land and the available land has a limitation to within a single Earth or the planet being just one precious Earth. So 
I mentioned of the carbon footprint. Of the six land category, um, there is uh, the applied usage. Now, the unit that is used is grams, uh, different um, from the unit of land, which is very remote from the original intent. Now, there are some disadvantages of just focusing on carbon. Now, we've been talking about the interlinkage. Take, for example, bioenergy its use may be instrumental in reducing the carbon footprint. But with that use, arable land or the for land available for forests, and their ecological footprint will go up. Therefore, the measurement of the ecological footprint to be presented in land. Now, with the increase of bioenergy, it may deprive the possibility um, of the increase of food production. So my point is, is that we should not just consider uh, reducing the carbon footprint, because that will end up in a very ill-balanced discussion. We should have a holistic perspective. We should have a holistic viewpoint to cover the different applications of land use. Therefore, the ecological footprint that covers the six different land category shall be used to have a holistic perspective. Because carbon footprint is biased. It focuses on a, just a certain area, certain segment. That's my comment. And there's two things that I forgot to mention in my presentation. ASEAN is currently using ecological footprint with the facilitations of the trade to what extent ecological footprint will reduce or increase is something that the ASEAN is trying to calculate. The Keidan Land of Japan is providing support to such a project. So there is a very interesting uh, project going on. Now, the core, the global footprint network uh, is the core institution of calculating the ecological footprint. Uh, they have come up with this brochure. Uh, they're headquartered in California, Auckland. They also have an office in Europe, and last month, they have established office in Okinawa as well. Questions from the audience? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I, I just uh, didn't Apologies, want to uh, I did uh, a little bit. Yeah, and that, that's all. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So I, I, apologies. I, Thank you very much. Uh -huh. No, sorry about that. I didn't know. Uh, David. I'll be very, very brief. Uh, should all goals have targets and indicators? Yes. What you don't measure, you don't manage. Um, should those targets be quantifiable wherever possible? Yes. If not, then quanti uh, qualitative targets will have to do. Um, set the appropriate time scale so there should be some longer term targets where that's appropriate with shorter term interim targets and indicators to track a pathway towards those ultimate goals. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the last set of questions is on implementation. Uh, but maybe this uh, to George and uh, Yoshida, maybe you could also include this in your response when we respond to the audience. Um, the questions on implementation uh, is how can we improve synergy between different financing mechanisms, uh, climate finance, ODA, FDI? Um, second question, how can we address uh, needs for governance reforms in the implementation of uh, sustainable development goals. So maybe you could integrate that in the answers. Um, so policies has taken a bit longer than uh, we expected. Um, maybe we can now uh, take questions, your questions to um, the experts. Maybe we can take this side, this half of the room first, and then we come back to this. Yes, uh, in the first row. Okay. 
My name is Hirono from Seike University. Thank you very much for your presentations. As I listened to your presentations, I fully understood the points you were trying to emphasize, yes. But the problem is uh, the something uh, the very uh, different, uh, that is to say, you need to look at the reality because what the four panelists have said, in integral approach is very important. Economic sustainability, social sustainability, environmental sustainability, you need to integrate everything that is important. Is emphasized by everybody. Uh, as uh, George had said, uh, the food, water, and energy that must be taken as a whole. But looking at uh, the developing economies, the major problems that they are faced with, let me give you one good example. Uh, Egypt. The Arab Spring, the country which is going through what is called the Arab Spring, I do fully understand the points you're trying to make, but having said so, what the people in Egypt uh, is trying to go for, they need to prioritize. And uh, the major challenge confronting them, the Arab Spring, is economic sustainability and social sustainability. And environmental sustainability may be less in terms of priority for Egyptians. That, I believe, is how they look at the, the situation. So as I see it, so theoretically, integration is important, relevant, and simultaneous achievement may be important. Yes, I do fully concur. That said, however, for each individual country, they are in different stages of development. So at particular stage of development, they may prioritize something else, and we need to respect, respect that. So in some sense, diversity that must be allowed. We need to, as much as possible, incorporate diversity. So what kind of approaches would be possible for them must be indicated. Unless we take into consideration those factors, integration or simultaneous achievement, theoretically, that is good, but look from the realistic point of view of economic or developmental stage, it may not uh, uh, do. So could you be more specific and concrete? Uh, the approach, which may be relevant to each country, must be indicated, and that, I believe, would be more pragmatic and realistic SDGs. So I would appreciate it if uh, comments can be provided by the panelists. Thank you. Yes, my name is Volker Maufer. I'm from the United Nations University Institute of Advanced Studies. I'm a senior research fellow there in the Sustainable Devel Development Governance Unit. Our, my question goes a little bit in the same direction than the previous question. It's about it's addressing all the panelists, and it's about the trade-offs. Currently, the goals are quite separately formulated, similar to the MDGs a little bit, with a stronger focus on the environmental direction. And I, I wonder in how far trade-offs should be and can be integrated in the formulation of the individual goals. At the moment, there is no prioritization in there. The question is if there should be one in there or if there should be some flexibility in there. And are, so how could these trade-offs, which were mentioned by several of the speakers, between the three dimensions of sustainability be better integrated into the formulation of the which number they ever will have goals and are at which stage of the process this should be done should this be uh, rather tried to be done earlier of the development of the goals or should it be done rather later if at all thank you yes, at the back Hello, my name is Binay from IGS. So, uh, my question is related with the goals uh, of, the STG, of the STG. So, in relation to the what we learned from the MDGs. So, one of the lessons I believe is uh, what we learned from MDGs is the progress uh, rate is very differentiated 
among the countries. And another point we found is uh, that the quality of the, like the, we see the statistics, how much is achieved, but we don't know about the quality of achievement. So there is also a risk of slipping back to the, what we have already achieved, especially in consideration to the climate change. So in that case, what would be the idea that we ask every country to propose their targets for its goals so that that can be achievable and they can show either qualitatively or quantitatively. I think that may be the one way, like how you can include the local indicators, like uh, how you connect local to the global uh, yeah, global scale. So that, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, may we ask the panelists to respond to the three questions. Uh, the first one from Professor Hirono about the integrated approach, simultaneous uh, need for implementation, universality, how do we differentiate develop, developing, emerging. Uh, second one from UNU, again the trade-offs, sectorial integrated, differentiation of the goals, and third one uh, on the metrics, I guess, between quantity, quality, and the MDGs, measured only certain aspects of uh, quantity and not the quality issues and sometimes we miss the whole point and there are many examples in the evaluation uh, reports of MDGs on this. Who would like to take, yes? I'm, I'm going to, I'm hearing myself. I'm, I'm going to uh, blend the two questions of integration and trade-offs and try to answer it as, as one. Uh, and I think we need to look at the different levels. Let's, for a moment, keep ourselves at the global level. Most probably, what's going to happen, incidentally, one need not call it a negotiation, but the discussions on the goals have already started, and that's a fact. Um, we're going to have anywhere between half a dozen to one dozen kind of a goals most probably, these are going to be very easy, universally acceptable, what I call motherhood goals. Nobody would be in a position to go against it. And I think it is useful to leave it alone. Then what is going to happen is, there's most probably going to be a large basket of targets and indicators. The equations in terms of the connections between the targets and indicators and how it relates to the goal is going to be a complex issue, which I don't think is going to get resolved before 2015. Okay? It's, it's going to take time beyond that. And what's more interesting, and that's where, sir, I want to come to your question of integration. Especially when you come to subnational. What you're talking about in the global context is going to get reflected. So these national governments are not going to get away with blue murder. In different contexts, you may agree to a goal which is so universal it's easy for you to agree. But each subnational government is going to say, my context is different. So while you need to see it as a whole, the emphasis on each of the thematic issues, whether environment, social, or whatever you want to call it, in a different location at different points of time is going to be different. However, if you have adequate stakeholder consultation to ensure that there's the balancing act, it could become easier. So the importance, I would say, picture as a whole integrated, emphasis at different points of times, different, and the most important, state, stakeholder groups and pressure groups keeping the pressure on. So this would be the way one visualizes this. Again, all these questions require long answers, which we don't have time for, but I'll, I'll just make a few points. Uh, in terms of the different priorities from the different countries, I have to address Hirono San, who's from my old university. So. Um, <laughs> Yes, each country has different priorities, but often those priorities are different in the short term and the long term. And it's very difficult for governments to recognize long term. And one of the good things about sustainable development goals is it will force countries to also think about the long term and not just the short term. You could argue that the Arab, one of the causes of the Arab Spring was the increase in food prices as a reduction of crop failures and so on. 
So while their focus may not be on the environment, actually as some of this may be one of the root causes of what has happened. Uh, in terms of trade-offs, I don't think there will be trade-offs in the goals. They will be mo motherhood statements. Um, but I think they can be dealt with in the targets. So for example, if you have a food target of increasing food production and you have a, a biodiversity target of not cutting down rainforest, then they're gonna work against each other. If, however, you have targets about uh, increasing the intensification of production of food and reducing food waste, then they can achieve both of those things. So I think they can be dealt with within the targets. And the third question was absolutely right. Um, there's a difference between um, just having a target and the quality at which those, that target is met. We have learned that from the, from the Millennium Development Goals. Just having a target to say every child will be in primary education is, you know, is great, but you know, that education has got to be a, a quality education. So I think that lesson has been learned and certainly there's a lot of focus going into that within the Sustainable Development Goals. Any comment on quality, quantity, metrics? Yes, please. Uh, a short answer, please. Okay. Eh, to Hiro no sensei no oshiro koto a hiro ni ugoka aru ndesu. Eh, tashikani ano, honto ni mo ano to. Metrics and countries. I understand uh, what you say. In the developing countries, uh, they are very much uh, busy uh, earning their living, and there are those communities as well. In terms of uh, ecological footprint, the understanding of ecological footprint did not exist uh, at all 10 years ago, but in ASEAN, Philippines, and Indonesia, uh, they tried to take that up as a nation. So, ecological footprint uh, is being more and more utilized uh, for the running of the government as well. The reason behind that is because the bio capacity that the country has is very important, not just for the short-term interest, and the short-term interest uh, should not compromise that. I think such understanding has been spreading gradually also, per capita photo, uh, ecological footprint, uh, if is looked at, then, then the least developed countries is uh, flat. Uh, however, the footprint of the developed countries are very much uh, increasing. And so we need to narrow the gaps uh, between them internationally. And so for that sake, uh, ecological footprint can be utilized. So from the developing countries' point of view, uh, do something uh, about it uh, uh, from the developing, uh, developed countries. And so that's how it is. えっと、あの、まず広野 はなんかその、どうして森を保全する必要があるのというような発言が結構見られることもあって。もちろんその、やってください。各国で。uh, what are the actions need to be undertaken, need to be recognized. So awareness raising is some kind of uh, necessity. But then for the targets and indicators, that comes below that level. As George said, we need to have uh, many indicators. And for different countries, they would pick and choose uh, what would be appropriate for each and every one of them. For example, uh, that, that is being proposed by government of Colombia. As for trade-off, as uh, Mr. Briggs have already indicated, that is exactly the kind of perspective that we need to introduce. If not, we had to may once again uh, make a mistake of something that we have seen for the MDGs. But the research are still lacking. We do see some studies, but uh, we still see some weaknesses here. So I just would like to stress going forward. And as Mr. Briggs have said, uh, for education, 
uh, on uh, the qualitative aspects are very important, and that would be a good lesson for the SDGs. And I'm sure uh, what has been lacking in the MDGs so rules subsequently had been incorporated into the SDGs. And now a report is something had a good. So the reporting system have not been successful under the UN system so far, but feasibility is something that we need uh, to uh, the research, make a research going forward. Thank you very much. Maybe we could take one question. Sorry, we've run out of time. Uh, one question from this side. No, quick. Apologies. Hello. Uh, Kevin Hicks from the Stockholm Environment Institute. So a fun question to finish with, but a serious underbelly. Um, on the television this morning, there was a fantastic picture of the Earth from underneath the rings of Saturn. You could see the, the Earth with its moon. And I was thinking, is the ultimate consequence of the Anthropocene uh, the need for global uh, governments of the biosphere? And do you think this might be possible by the end of the 22nd century? And could it be based on George's uh, ease and perhaps a global citizen tax on the wealthy? Uh, who would like to give a short response? David? Um, that's a, that's a, a difficult question in the sense that uh, there would be many countries in the world where a global governance system would be totally, completely, and utterly unacceptable. Um, and so I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Hopefully what we can come up with are forms of governance and institutional arrangements which will allow that governance to take place um, at a global scale um, in a cooperative way between nation states. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to apologize for this half of the audience. Please cast the experts as they go out. Um, just in closing, um, just a few messages from this session. Um, if I may take the liberty to uh, make a few points. Um, one, MDGs have improved the quality of life of billions. MDGs have rallied the world behind a common approach for development. And this is where we go next to the post-2015. Um, although the MDGs will expire in 2015, as we've heard in other sessions and also from our panel of experts, that we still have uh, challenges to address. And uh, these include extreme poverty and hunger, preventable disease and health, um, rising inequalities, among countries and within uh, each country. And the last one, and I guess more stress on that, environmental crisis and climate change. Um, something UN has done which it had not done before. I think UN is beginning to realize that we are in a hyper-connected digital age and social media as we have seen uh, with the Arab Spring that was mentioned and many other uh, continents uh, is becoming very important. So DPI and UNDG uh, had a global public consultation and in any given day there was up to 1.4 million people that participated in this. Um, just four quick points that came out and I think the leadership both country, national leadership, and UN leadership need to pay more and more attention to this kind of a public uh, sentiment. So first one that came out, uh, that the global agenda needs to be backed by national policy action. Um, as George was mentioning, we cannot be forever in hot air up there and not realizing the reality at the national and local level. Um, second, the political leadership should take action to create conditions for more equitable, healthier, and safer world. Um, safer world with population as in one planet and the differentiation between countries and regions to be brought together. Uh, third, poverty and protecting the climate, plan protecting the planet are two sides of one coin both require firm foundation based on human rights that provide people security and stability 
through ru rule of law and good governance. This came out very clearly in all the discussions. And last, that we need to achieve one single cohesive agenda. This is a strong message to the UN and the 45 plus agencies that seem to be working in different directions that we need one single and cohesive agenda. The post-2015 development agenda needs to be transformative, universal, equitable, with sustainable development at its core. So I think the, these messages that are coming from the public um, is very clear. I also want to mention the while the discussions on SDGs and the post-2015 is ongoing, um, some of the leadership have said uh, what we want as an outcome by September 2015. Uh, so they are looking at two parts of an outcome document. Uh, first, a narrative that sets the direction for the 21st century uh, with sustainable development and poverty eradication as the overarching goal. Um, second, we embrace the concept of well-being, human well-being, giving priority to human well-being within the limitations of the planet well-being. So this is increasingly being accepted by member states uh, in New York. And the second part of the document, while the first part sets the direction and vision for the 21st century, the second part looks at the action and implementation that is needed for the next 15, 30 years. What are necessary and urgent actions that countries need to take to achieve that long-term goal of sustainable development? And these are the SDGs. It is the prioritization of the international community for action towards sustainable development in the next 15, 30 years and the next 15, 30 years, what might be a different set of SDGs, but what do we need to get done as a grouping of countries within planet Earth so that we achieve uh, sustainable development? Um, the metrics, the GDP plus, uh, are necessary uh, for all the countries, and indicators, both quality and quantity. This is also responding um, to our colleague from IGES who asked about the quality and quantity. So for this task, the UN Statistical Commission uh, is the lead for this, and they are bringing together experts um, to do this. So we address the complexity of sustainable development in the narrative, and we articulate the simplicity of how we achieve this in the second part of the document, the action agenda. So as an example uh, that has been often quoted is at the global level, uh, we have a goal like meet the basic needs of all people by 2030. We define basic needs by food, water, energy, education, shelter, and health, and allow each country to define its target and use the universal indicators that's done, that's um, suggested by the Statistical Commission. So with that, uh, let me thank our panel of experts. Thank you for sharing your experience and knowledge with us. Uh, we thank every one of you in the audience for your participation. And from all of us here on, in the stage, we would like to thank IGES, um, ISAP, uh, has, is an annual forum, I think is an uh, annual event we look forward to, to express our ideas, gather and exchange knowledge. And we hope it continues to, uh, to be a forum to disseminate the global level uh, down and also put forward the Asian perspectives up to the global level. Thank you very much. でした様、パネリストの皆様、どうもありがとうございました。それではこ、Thank you very much, Mr. Shrestha and the panelists. And、uh, there's a refreshment is available in front of 501 room and green path, greenways、uh, towards a green,、uh, excuse me, pathways that was a green economy.